So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar, uh, Managing Money and Debt During a Crisis, brought to you by Access Community Capital Fund uh, in collaboration with uh, Credit Canada Debt Solutions, uh, our community partner. And we welcome you to this uh, session. Um, they, we had a previous session uh, a few weeks ago and due to popular demand and a lot of questions, we figured we would invite uh, uh, Elena back uh, to give us another uh, uh, session uh, which uh, uh, will cover a number of different uh, important uh, topics around um, uh, money management, budgeting, credit, uh, and uh, debt uh, management as well. So just to uh, get us started before we go into the presentation, I will give you some housekeeping uh, Tips. Uh, if you're new to Zoom, uh, you will see uh, at the bottom of your screen that there is a menu bar and uh, we will be communicating with you uh, through the chat box. And if you have any questions, uh, please uh, post them in the uh, uh, question and answer uh, chat uh, section of it. Then at the end of the presentation, we will open it up for questions and uh, Elena will be able to answer any questions you might have. Uh, so uh, we will get started and we will move to just share a little bit about uh, Access Community Capital Fund if you've not heard about us before. Uh, we are a nonprofit agency. I'm just going to move this. So we are, uh, that's my name. I'm the, uh, I'm Otis Mishonga. I'm the manager of programs and services at Access Community Capital Fund. Uh, and uh, feel free to get in touch with me. I'll be your moderator today. And uh, any questions you may have about Access Community Capital Fund, feel free to uh, reach out to me directly, or you can uh, reach out to us uh, through our uh, standard uh, uh, mailbox, uh, which I will present at the end of this uh, presentation. So just to give you a brief uh, overview of Access Community Capital Fund, we are a registered charity based here in Toronto. And we give uh, people facing financial barriers uh, in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area, the opportunity to reach their potential uh, and achieve financial security through sustainable employment and self-employment. So we provide um, affordable microloans and facilitate those to people who want to achieve their dreams of owning a small business uh, for themselves uh, in order to improve their income or to find success in a rewarding career here in Canada uh, having uh, had their credentials obtained outside of Canada. We focus on small business uh, uh, loans uh, and uh, these are up to 5,000 for first time applicants and uh, up to 10,000 for returning clients. And we uh, offer support around business coaching as well as uh, uh, general support ongoing through uh, the pre-application stage as well as the post-loan stage, uh, keeping you uh, supported throughout to find the best success uh, and to ensure that uh, you, you have uh, all that you need to, to succeed in your uh, small business. Our other program is our foreign credential recognition loans, uh, which are for newcomers or internationally trained professionals who are uh, here in Canada and are looking to get back into their original profession a related uh, career or uh, explore a new career altogether. And we facilitate up to 15,000 to uh, help pay for career related expenses so that they can create a better future for themselves and Canada. We also offer financial coaching uh, to individual clients as well and as a group. Our last program is our Women's Business Accelerator program, which is a free business uh, program uh, for uh, women, which equips them with the skills and the tools that they need to succeed in business. Uh, whether you're new to Canada uh, and you uh, have uh, an idea to start your own business or you've uh, been here for a while and you uh, want to explore uh, starting your own business or if you have already a business but you need to brush off on some of the key aspects of running a business by yourself, this is the, one of our key programs that takes you through a series of workshops and uh, support uh, with our uh, uh, business coaches uh, or one-on-one -on -one providing you guidance as you develop your business plan uh, and also uh, plan, uh, helping you uh, make uh, a, a presentation 
uh, of your plan uh, at the pitch uh, session that we have at the end of the program. So we are looking to uh, our new next uh, cohort, which uh, will be announced soon uh, in, 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 a, in, in some time. So keep tuned to us and uh, uh, we will be providing that information on when the next cohort starts. We just wrapped up the last cohort uh, about a week ago. Just more around eligibility who uh, can access our services. So we serve everyone who is a Canadian citizen, permanent resident or a conventional refugee and who is a resident of the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area and anyone 18 or years or older with a legal right to work in Canada. And we focus on demonstrated financial needs, so any, anyone who faces uh, some challenges uh, and in terms of accessing funding through the traditional channels, uh, such as banks and other financial institutions. We help uh, in uh, reviewing your, uh, your goal, whether it's uh, for small business, your career, and we uh, help in uh, facilitating the funds that you need to get started or to grow your business or to uh, pay for your career-related expenses. We want to make sure that you're up to date on your personal taxes and you're not going through a consumer proposal or facing a high debt load. And this, uh, that's why it's uh, perfect that we have Elena from uh, Credit Canada today to speak to those two aspects and uh, many more uh, because these are uh, uh, um, issues that will likely prevent most from uh, getting the uh, startup financing or the loans that they need to advance their business or their career. And we help uh, not just more by facilitating the loans, we also uh, ensure that our clients are well supported throughout by uh, through education such as these webinars as well as through um, uh, one to one coaching and uh, making sure that they can improve their credit and uh, be ready to uh, take the next step in their uh, business uh, growth or in their career as so that they are able to access other funding opportunities or financing through traditional means. And we partner with Alterna Savings and uh, get uh, funding from the Government of Canada. So connect with us and these are the ways that you can reach out to us and uh, keep uh, in touch with us. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Elena so that she can uh, take us through the presentation. And again, as you, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A uh, section of the menu bar at the bottom of your screens. And I'll hand it over to Elena Jara. She's the Director of Education at uh, Credit Canada uh, and uh, they have been around for many years and they work to help individuals who face uh, debt or who have uh, challenges with their finances to get them back on track and to find solutions that can uh, really uh, make a difference in uh, personal finance uh, for individuals and households. So I'll hand it over to Elena at this point and she can uh, share her screen and get us going in the presentation. Thank you for joining us once again. Excellent, thanks so much um, Otis. It's a pleasure to be here with everybody. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm at the right slide, so I'm gonna get started. Um, right about here from current slides. So um, I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. Um, it's a beautiful day outside. So um, hopefully this after this workshop, you can go out and just go out for a nice little walk. Uh, my name is Elena and I am the Director of Education for Credit Canada Debt Solutions. Um, Credit Canada has been around for over uh, 54 years and we've been servicing the community at large and uh, we offer free uh, confidential counseling as well as these types of webinars in the community. So today what we're going to be talking about is money management and budgeting and of course we're going to talk about how COVID is, ha is and has been affecting us. And sometimes just life happens right and what I mean by that is it, anything can happen, unemployment, illness, even a marriage breakdown. So that's what Credit Canada is for. Credit Canada is here to assist you in any way possible. We also do a lot of referrals with our clients and one of our community partners is of course Access Community Capital Fund where we tend to refer people when they're thinking about opening their own business. We're also looking at what should, um, you know, warning signs um, when it comes to debt. Are you um, experiencing any um, difficulty paying your bills? Are you 
experiencing anxiety, stress, are you not sleeping well? Or maybe um, there's a lot of um, uh, bickering happening in the house, which means you're arguing about money, either with uh, family members, with a spouse, or you're getting a lot of phone calls from a collection agency. A lot, any of those things that are happening, those are really um, big warning signs that something that, that you're not managing your money or you don't have enough money to pay back your bills. So today we're going to be talking about creating a spending plan, um, setting financial goals and saving tips. The top part about this is really understanding how to create a spending plan. Most of us are, um, are pretty good at maintaining our budget, especially right here in our head. We know how much money comes in, how much money goes out. But, you know, when uh, we're under stress, it's not the same thing. So the other process that uh, we're going to talk about, it's a four-step process. And really the, the best thing that you could do is um, like my grandmother's time and probably yours too which is like uh, pen and paper um, you can carry that with you and you can record all your expenses I do want to go through this um, four-step plan by the way we do have some handouts for you um, I believe that that's all included in here that you could download at any time the first step about creating a spending plan on good times is writing down all of your income, whatever income you're receiving, whether it be from work, whether it be from social assistance or CERB, whatever you're getting. And if you have children, also like um, any other income that you're getting with regards to, um, uh, in my time it was called baby bonus. I think it's child tax credit right now. So I'm definitely aging myself. Um, so the next step would be to write down all of your fixed expenses. For some of you, um, some of your expenses that are fixed are probably right now on um, a payment deferral, um, but rent for some of you, that may not be the case. So you, if you're still paying that, you have to write that down. Childcare, probably not using that right now, but we'll get into that anyways. And transportation. Normally you would have to write down your expenses. Um, and I like to look at the flexible expenses. Those are the expenses that you decide where, when, and how you're gonna uh, use your money. So when we talk about uh, flexible expenses and groceries, a lot of people are thinking, well, the groceries is, you know, I have to do that, you're right. But you decide where you're gonna go shopping, you decide um, when you're gonna shop, and how much. So when it comes to possibilities with groceries, that's what I like about this exercise is it really talks you through the possibilities. So I, I when I go grocery shopping, I go through flyers, I use the Flip app, um, I use some coupons, and I also go to alternative food markets. Um, and right now, of course, there used to be the farmer's market. Um, the one thing that's still around, which is the good food box, um, if you don't know anything about it, Google it. It's amazing. Um, it's, a, it's also called uh, Food Share. And what it does, it's, um, it works with all of the local uh, farmers and they get fresh fruits and, veg and, and vegetables, which they put in a box for you and the prices are pretty reasonable. Um, right now, um, you know, laundry. The other thing that you may all look want to look at is entertainment. Right now, maybe different for you. And then we have clothing and personal uh, grooming. Of course, not. This is in regular times. Remember that this is not like COVID nineteen, where all these things are not available right now. Step three would be um, totaling up your income. So, how much money are you getting? Then your total expenses. And then you're gonna be able to see right here, um, you know what, I love to, this is my favorite part where I get to use um, some of these pretty cool things. And let's see if I can use this. So right about here, you're gonna add everything up. And then you're gonna see whether you have any money left over or if you're short on money. And really this is what you wanna do. You wanna make sure you do the math here. Let me get out of that. 
And then, so like I was saying to you, in the good old days, we were relying on pen and paper. Credit Canada has this little booklet, which is called the Monthly Budget Tracker. You can um, download it from our website. I Unfortunately, I didn't have the right um, download today. I can always pass it to uh, Otis and then you can ask him for it. Um, we also have to talk about your budget during crisis. So what's the difference between a regular budget and a crisis budget? Well, a crisis budget is normally something that is temporary. It's not going to be a, a permanent thing. And um, remember, you know, you can cut back certain things that are not going to affect your regular life, especially for a little while. So how do you start creating a temporary or uh, a crisis budget. Um, I would just call it a COVID-19 budget. I would hate to call it just a crisis budget because it sounds so negative. And sometimes crisis seems like it's never going to end. So think of a better word. Think of a, a, of a, of a, a word that you're comfortable with so that you could um, do this budget uh, process. Start thinking about the things that um, you're spending money on right now and that you don't not going to be spending on and you know we're already in COVID like almost three months and that tells us that you know we have pretty much adjusted to our new COVID budget so let's go through that so let's for example there's things that are needs and things that are wants and you've already gone we've gone through some of those things and again, um, let's look at that, how it would work and how do you identify what's a need and what's a want. Normal needs, rent, mortgage, utility bills, groceries, gas for the car, insurance. I do have to tell you something about the gas though. I mean, since I'm working from home, I um, filled up again, the, my gas tank at least probably every three to four weeks. And it's like, and the only reason I fill it up, it's just because it makes me feel good, but I probably put in like another 10 or $20 and not a lot of money, right? So um, again, because I'm not using the car every day. Then of course we have um, the wants, dinner out. Um, that's not really happening. You could of course order in uh, movie tickets. I think most of us are probably spending a lot more time watching Netflix. Hair cosmetics, what can I tell you about that? Um, you know, when it comes to hair, I think we're all doing the the at home version. And then, of course, there's the top tier cell phone data plans. Uh, I think some of you, if you haven't thought about it, you could always go back and change some of your uh, data plans so that um, because you're at home most of the time, you could probably do a lot of the, the Wi-Fi, which is way more affordable. Then we look at, um, you know, once you create this budget, um, you really have to look at what's your personal situation as of right now, like what's happening and how is it really changing for you or has impacted you. Let's say, for example, that for now you've created your budget, you're good to go. Then we're also looking at the fact that, hey, if you haven't created one and maybe you're not old school like I am where you need paper and pen, maybe you'd like something that's more technologically, you know, 2020, then you're looking at the Credit Canada Budget Planner, go to visit our website, download this information, and um, you'll be able to put in all of your numbers and it will do the math for you, which is super cool. Where do we start? I love Lucy. I don't know if you guys love Lucy, but I like her a lot. Um, a good place to start is uh, regarding your income. Um, you know, you're going to have to redo your budget and based on the idea that right now your income has dropped considerably. And because the prices happen, um, you got to make sure that you go to an extreme with your COVID budget, okay? Uh, again, I'm not calling it a crisis. I'm just calling it COVID-19. When we look at our regular budget, we're looking at the fact that, hey, at one time, you know, things were really good. We're working full time. Uh, maybe now we're just working part time or maybe we're on a call basis or just getting CERB or getting social assistance. I'm not sure what your situation is, but think about it. Um, once you do your budget, you'll have a, like a regular budget. And this is just an example so we can work from that. So you could see that the regular expenses when um, we were um, pre-COVID. And now we're looking at 
a crisis budget. And what does that mean? Well, it means that there's a lot of changes that we need to take into consideration. The first one, of course, is your income, and that's dropped to half, right? Then we ask ourselves, well, what can I change? What can I reduce? So for some of us, we um, if you're landlord's really good and they can defer the payments then we have or a mortgage we can defer the mortgage then we can do that we can that can go um that can be reviewed um there's also the car payments that can be reviewed right and then of course then we have um the other expenses such as car maintenance right now like i said to you I'd probably drive once a week to go grocery shopping um and um my gas has also reduced considerably i am not eating out as much and um uh, some of you i think um just like me uh entertainment there's nothing like that um aside from a walk in the park and that's free so i want to show you um where can we ask for deductions of course, internet. We can always call internet. There's so many other possibilities now. I know a lot, a lot of people who don't have cable, but they do have internet because now they have smart TVs and they can download um, some applications that allows them to watch TV, um, online TV, and so forth. So there's some things to think about. Then, of course, we have the cell phone plan. We have the car insurance. I actually did this too. Um, I didn't stop my car insurance, but I did get 20% back for the last three months. So that made me pretty happy. I was like, all right, I got a little bit of money to spend. Um, so th those are probably areas that you can look for reduction. And then other areas that you can cut back, it's of course clothing. Right now, you know, I'm not sure about you, but when I'm at home, I like to dress very comfortable, except for, of course, during work hours. Uh, and then I, you know, I like to dress. But, you know, normally it's like it, we're still not dressing, dressing up, so we don't need clothing that is dressed up and we're not overusing stuff. So that's an area that you can come back. There's also the gym. Of course, you're not using that right now because that's closed. So when we look at the crisis budget, you're like, okay, well, so what's happening now? Well, let's look at this. So we look at the, our incomes dropped. We're not paying rent, got the utilities. Um, and let's look at the areas that are gonna stamp. Uh, so groceries, I wanna point this out because just like everybody else, me too, I am also spending a lot of money on groceries. Whatever I used to spend before, it's not the same for two reasons. Most of us are trying to eat comfort food, um, which means that we're buying things that normally would, we would have just bought once in a while, but now we're buying it more often. Um, also, groceries have gone drastically up, and, um, and we're eating a lot more at home. We're not eating out, so we're eating at home. So I think that's one of the, re of the many reasons that groceries have gone up. Um, now remember one thing, this is a temporary budget and what it means is also the sum, there's, that you also have some temporary savings. So let's look at this, there's um, the rent, look at this, annotation, we're going to look at, we have rent, we have car insurance that you probably have asked um, to, um, to either defer and that means that you're not making any payments and that's why you probably have a little bit of um, a little bit of, of savings. And you're wondering, well, I have all this kind of savings right now. Yeah, you do, which is great. However, please keep in mind that at one point, when CERB is up, you're gonna have to catch up with some of those deferred payments. And that's something that you really need to understand. Let me see what's going on here. I'm not sharing anymore. Oh, there we go. So you gotta work out your options. And what does that mean? You really have to, oh, let me go back up. I want you to make sure that you understand that when you're looking at all of your, um, your finances, your, your regular budget and your COVID-19 budget, I want you to make sure that any extra little, any extra money you have, whether it's little or a lot, please make sure you take it and move it to another um, bank account so that you're not tempted to touch it. Especially now that things are starting to uh, open up. I know winners is starting to open up and all sorts of 
the places, you know, our favorite places that we'd love to hang out and, and maybe, you know, buy uh, one or two things here and there, please, you know, keep that in mind that if you're going to spend money, make sure the money is specifically for that item and that you're not taking from your savings because again, this money is going to have to be paid back. So make sure you to work out all of your options. I want to talk about credit because, you know, a lot of time people are saying, well, what about credit? What's going to happen to my credit rating? Um, there's all sorts of things that you need to understand, but when it comes to banks and the banks and the credit unions, they're, they're there to help you, but they also, um, there's two types of banks. Um, the big banks are offering you credit at a discounted rate. There's the subprime lenders that offer credit at a more expensive rate, and I am going to explain that. So subprime rate just means that you're getting a loan from a, a company that normally gives out loans to people who have a poor credit history, who are, um, you know, have temporary jobs. Um, and so they're, they're considered uh, more of a credit risk. So a high interest rate, sometimes people wonder, well, you know, when you get a loan, you just get so excited, you get a loan and you're like, yeah, I got the loan. And they tell you how much you have to pay. You're like, great, I can afford that. But you're not really thinking of the actual cost. And that's one of the questions that you have to ask is, how much is this really costing me? And that's what the annual percentage rate is all about. It's telling you that this is what the total cost of the debt is going to be once you're done. So I want to show you that um, because one of the things that we tend to do is not ask that question. It's the math. The math is the one thing that really scares a lot of us. So let's say, for example, I'm going to borrow $5,000 from X company. The repayment is going to be $133.45. And I am going to pay this every two weeks. And then how long will it take for me to pay this? It's about 60 months. It's about five years. So I'm going to borrow $5,000. I'm going to repay 133 every two weeks for 60 months. Let's do the math. So I take $133.45. I multiply it by 26, which is um, 26 pay periods. And you multiply it by five, which is five years. And then you have the, um, the total amount, which is $17,348.50. So when I do the, when I, you know, look at the full cost of this loan, it's actually $12,348.50. And I'm like, wow, how, uh, what? Okay, so um, now that you, you, you understand a little bit of the math, just by the way, oh, oops, hang on a second. I'm going to go back. Just so you know, that's about almost about 45% of, or sorry, 35% of um, interest rates. Um, and that's a lot of money. So please make sure to ask and um, make sure to work out the interest rates. By the way, just so you know, um, basically more, the question is more for me. And I want to know if you do know. Do you know what's the maximum interest rate that you can be charged? Can, can anyone um, write it down in the chat and maybe two or three people will say, um, anyone take a wild guess? Um, so let's say you, maybe someone said 20, maybe someone said 35 because someone we said 60. Oh, you've seen this before. Good for you. So really, that's exactly it. You are correct. So what we're saying is that 60 is the maximum interest rate you can be charged here in Canada. And if you're charged anything above a 60%, that would be a federal crim criminal offense. And really, so normally you're charged 59.99%. So it's, it is a federal offense. Um, now, here's the thing. The one company that is, or industry that is exempt from this um, law, is, and they're the payday loan companies. And the reason that they're exempted is because of the wording that they use, um, that they've used when they've set up this industry. They're not saying that they're charging you interest, they're, they're saying it's a lending fee. So I just wanna make sure I get you that. Ah, there it is, payday loans. Um, so here's how payday loans interest works. Um, let's say you were to borrow $100 for a period of two weeks and you have to pay $15 um, in fees, so it would be $115. But let's say you want to borrow $300 um, in a period of two weeks. So, 
if I was, so, and this is from the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services. This is the information that they're sharing with everybody. So when you look at over here, you're saying, okay, so I, I'm borrowing $300 for the next two weeks. It's actually just $45. When we think, oh, so I'll have to give you back $345. All right, but if I were to borrow that same amount from a credit card, it would only cost me $6.50 for those two weeks. So you could see that there's a difference of approximately $38. That's a significant amount when you do the math, right? How about we do the math for a full year? So you borrow $300 and that's for 26 pay periods. And really at the end of the year, you will have paid $1,170 for the $300. That's a lot of money. So if you're really tempted on borrowing money, my advice to you, if it's only like a couple of hundred dollars just because you're gonna be short on one bill or, 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 you, or, or you're just not sure that you can have enough money, you should contact your bank and see if they can offer you an overdraft account that's connected to your regular checking or savings account. Why do you want to do that? If you have anything that's pre-authorized, such as your, your, your cell phone, your internet, and the money's automatically coming out of your account, an overdraft will certainly help because that way you're not going to get yourself in trouble uh, because it's like you're bouncing a check even though you're not bouncing a check. Um, it's because the payment's not going through. And it could actually be more costly for the payment not to go through um, than for you to have an overdraft. So if you can, please go back to your bank and ask for an overdraft. And they'll base it on, um, on your income. They'll also base it on your um, um, credit rating. And based on all that, because it is a loan, they'll say to you, you know what, you qualify for X. And normally, I mean, some people, the, the minimum you can qualify, I think it's two to 50. And then there really, there is no maximum. You can go up to four or 5,000 or $6,000, depending on what your um, credit risk is. So here's credit in you. So what is a credit report? So a credit report is a report where they can pretty much put all of your uh, information and they update this information on a monthly basis. That's all. So Equif Equifax and TransUnion, they're credit bureau companies and what they do is they, they receive information and that information that's received is then they then create a file for you and that file will have your monthly information based on your payments, um, the amount of credit that you have, and uh, the, the amount that you're borrowing every month. Who is interested in seeing this? A lot of people say, well, you know, I don't really want to credit. I don't want to put myself at that risk, you know, risk myself of getting into debt and so forth, and I don't blame you. But here's the thing. If you don't own a house, if you, you know, if you own a house, it means you're going to stay there for a long time. Um, if you don't and you're renting and you move around a lot, landlords want to check your credit report. And then utility companies will want to check your credit report because they want to give you, they, they're saying, well, how do we know you're going to pay us back? We want to make sure you you don't have a history with us. Uh, insurance companies uh, want to um, uh, check your credit report. So if you have uh, a car, a house insurance, believe it or not, I own a house and then I was um, moving to a, a, a different company and they asked um, to check my credit report for the new insurance company, which I thought, oh, okay. Um, and of course, employers, employers are also the ones that want to know, you know, have you ever been in trouble financially? Because they, they don't want you to, um, they, they want to know that they're getting the right person for the job. So when you look at your credit rating, this is pretty much what you're going to see. You're going to see an R rating, which is um, pretty much, um, it's, uh, it's just showing you that this is your information on a monthly basis. So when uh, you see a, a, a zero, it just means that there is no information on your file. And the reason that there is no information is because you're either new to the country, um, you're under 18, or you've never applied for credit. Um, and by the way, the R, um, it's not restricted. It just means revolving. Um, and it just means that you have a credit card and it allows you to carry a balance on a monthly basis. A one means you're paying on time and this is the best credit rating you can have. 
a two means you make you're probably one month behind about close to 30 days behind from the due date and um, therefore you are one month behind an r3 is two months behind an r4 is three months behind and when you get to the r5 it just means like hey um, the creditors have been calling sending you letters sending you uh, emails they want to hear from you they have not heard from you so they feel that you're avoiding them and because you're avoiding them what they're going to do is they're going to change your um, R5 rating all the way down to a nine, which means that, oh, I love doing this. So it'll go from a five all the way down to a nine. And why does, and why is that? It's because they're saying, well, your account has been in default for a long time. And because now you, because you didn't answer, we've now transferred you to the collection side and the collection agency will now demand that you speak to them, um, demand that you make a payment. And if they can't get that from you, then the last thing they're going to do is they're going to threaten to take you to court so that they can garnish your wages. Um, let me just go through here. And um, all right. Oh, what's going on? Oh, so checking your own credit. So normally uh, you could go directly to your bank account, especially if you do online banking. There is a part there that says your your um, your services, and in there you can check your credit score, but not your full report. However, you could um, check your credit score and report directly from Equifax and TransUnion. If um, for TransUnion, you can go online and it, it is, they'll give you your credit report for free. For Equifax, you will have to submit uh, a request and normally you have to either mail it or fax it in. This is what it would look like when if you look at your report and I believe this is from TransUnion, you'll look at your account services, your daily transaction limits, they'll get ask you to check um, your, your credit um, score your profile and preferences and other links. They'll ask for you to, you know, agree and continue. And then there's three important points here. Um, actually, so there's just important points. When you check your credit report, it's considered a soft inquiry. It does not affect your credit report. So therefore there's no effect. Um, and it's very important that you check it at least once a year so that you know exactly what's being said about your transactions. So we look at TransUnions and this is a sample that we got. And um, so the score shows 819. And when you see it right here, you'll see that um, the numbers right here uh, can vary, for example. Um, so when you see numbers like 300 to 692, what does that mean? It means that that's considered someone who has who is a high risk and a high risk means that you probably file for bankruptcy or consumer proposal or you just stopped making payments or you had something was happening in your life that just you know unfortunately did not allow you to pay back your debt then we go all the way up to 693 to 742 anything above a 693 or, or 700 you're doing really well you're not doing really well but you're doing a lot better and what does that mean? That means that you considered a somewhat okay risk um, and you're going to get credit, but some creditors can still ask you for either a co-signer or some collateral. 743 to 789, it's not bad, but of course you wanna be anywhere around the uh, 790 and the 900 because then you are considered a very, very low risk, which means that you can, anywhere you apply based on your income, your credit rating, you most likely you are going to get accepted. Let me close that. Um, all right. So you'll see your credit report and it looks like this. And you'll also see that, hey, um, this is your account summary. Let me, uh, uh, let me undo, clear everything. Clear, clear. Okay, so the first thing you, let me just go back here. I'm not sure why I'm getting stuck. Here we go. Um, your account summary, 
is right there and then you'll see your credit shot report and your credit score which is right um, the numbers are shown there uh, you'll also get to see your name um, your date of birth your current address you really need to make sure that they've got your right name sometimes let's say my name is um, Peter and I go by Petey um, that's it that's what also known as aka therefore you know if I go by another name and that's the name that I like to be called and it's there make sure that it's the right spelling and so forth um, you'll also see that there are inquiries and inquiries just means that people who come sorry not people normally it's companies that reviewed your um, your file so for example here you'll see that you use um, RBC direct investment Royal Bank Visa Telus mobility um, the person obviously banks with Royal Bank and then this MBNA and they have all the information there then I look at all oh, okay so showing me the type of accounts that I have. Now remember I said there's the R for revolving. Well for this one it's telling you there's revolving, installments, and other accounts. So an installment account would be like Toyota Credit. So I got a car loan and that car loan I have to make regular monthly payments. Of course you can't see the balance or balance date or the payment but you could see that I am expected to make a regular either bi-weekly or monthly payment on this car loan. And then there's the other accounts, which the phone, um, just so you know, phones are definitely um, uh, reported and there you'll see it. And it's, uh, and that's considered some, these are considered other accounts, which are like open accounts, which means that all those accounts that are open, they expect a full payment every month. So another charge card account would be like American Express where if you borrow any amount of money they'll say absolutely but at the end of the month you have to pay the full thing public records it just means that if there's anything that's in your file when it's gone to court that would be considered a public record and then we go right back to uh, your accounts which is going to show you and of course you'll be able to just, I just want to make sure I, I show you the difference. The big difference is that the other one is showing you your accounts individually, just like this one, but um, this is a monthly based one where they're showing you exactly what's going to, what you're going to see based on what you used and what you paid and so forth. But then when we look at your credit score, that's a different story because when we talk about the credit scoring formula, they're taking into consideration five items or five factors. One is the payment history, the credit utilization, the length of history, the account mix, and the inquiries. So let's look at that, for example. Look at the payment uh, history, and really that that's a big factor. They're looking at 35% of your of your formula is based on that. So if I'm making late payments, that's going to certainly affect my credit score. Then we look at the credit utilization, which is 30% of your score. Again, it's a big factor. So uh, you know, what do I have? Do I have just a credit card? Do I have a, a loan? Do I have uh, a charge card? What do I have? How many things do I have? And therefore, they're going to calculate that in the, in the formula. Just so you know, um, and I know I talked about different items, so I kind of got confused, but credit line utilization is also what you're using. So I remember I mentioned three cards, but here's the other thing that goes with that is if I have one credit card and I'm only that with the credit limit of $5,000, but I'm using $500, then I'm only using 10%, so that's, the, you know, that's not bad. And then, of course, let's say, for example, things are a little tough or, you know, I just got pretty lazy and decided that I'm not going to use my money. I'm just going to leave my money to earn interest, but I want to use my credit card because I want to get points. So I'm, I'm using up a lot more of uh, the credit um, available to me. So now I'm at 50%. And then, of course, I've gone up to 4,500, which is 90%. What does that mean? If I'm using less than 35%, I'm considered low risk. If I'm using less than seven, from 35 to 70%, I'm considered medium risk. And then if I'm using from 70 to 100, I'm considered high risk. What does that mean? It means that 
the creditors are going to get nervous and fidgety and saying, well, wait a second, you're borrowing a lot of money. Um, is there a reason? And then um, why, you know, are, are you going to be able to pay this back? That's always going to be their question. Of course, we have the length of history. How long have you had this um, credit card or loan for? So, for example, someone like me who's lived here most of my life and I've had a credit card from a very young age, I've had this for a very long time. Someone who's just arrived to Canada has only been here a year or two years, their length of history is way shorter than mine. So they're going to be measured a little bit more different than I would, right? Then we have, of course, the credit mix. And that's what I was talking about. You know, how many credit, what type of credit do you have? Like, that's part of the credit utilization. And that means, um, do you have a credit card? Do you have a car loan? Do you have a line of credit? Um, or how many credit cards do you have? So they, they're looking at that. That's only 10%. And this is where a lot of the um, misunderstanding it, um, begins, where some people say, well, in order for you to have a really good credit score, you need more of a more than just one credit card. That's just because it's some it's one factor in calculating the credit score. It's not really one of the most important factors as you could see from what I showed you before. And of course then you'll go back to um, to your accounts and you'll say, okay, well, so is it actually showing the right information about my accounts? And then of course when we go back to that, uh, to the previous one, you'll see that, okay, this is the information about your accounts. But the other one's the inquiries. I think I mentioned that before. And what it means is that every time you apply for a credit card, every time you apply for a loan or a mortgage or anything, that's considered an inquiry. If you check your credit report, it's considered a soft inquiry. If you Ha, apply for something and someone else is checking, that would be considered a hard inquiry. And that's when you start to lose points. Payment history, we go right back to that. And of course, what happens if I skip a payment? So, you're, you know, I'm, I want to be clear on this. You know, from March 15th on, COVID-19 started in Canada. And luckily for us, we've had payment deferrals. And for some of us, that has been something that we've used. But the process is a little different than skipping a payment. So I want to make sure we're clear. A payment deferral is where you call the bank and you have actually uh, filled out the form and they sent you an email saying you have been um, accepted and you don't have to worry for X number of months or until we contact you with the new payments for the, for the payment deferral. If you choose to skip a payment because you've heard that the CERB and, and there's the mortgage deferrals and the credit card deferrals and because of that you said, well, you know, I qualify too, so I'm, I guess I, I'm there, right? Not so fast because the reality is, is that you really have to make sure that you actually filled out the paperwork, contacted the bank in order to make sure that and you got something in writing saying that the payment was deferred. But when you skip a payment, it's because you decided on your own that you're not going to pay because you thought it was okay. So that's not okay because that will affect your credit score. So please keep that in mind. And, and that's something that you want to make sure because then what's going to happen is going to show you as delinquent. It's going to be when you skip a payment. But when you have a payment deferral, you will not be seen as delinquent. And that's going to be your payment history, of course, where it's, um, so what happens when you defer your payments? I want to show you. So we, you know, these are hard times and I know that we want to conserve cash, but we want to make sure you understand the consequences down the road. So as I said before, if you do have a deferral, your credit report's not going to be affected. By the way, if you have questions about um, how the um, credit score or Equifax is actually calculating all this, we do have a webinar coming up this Thursday at four o'clock at Credit Canada. If you want more information, I'm sure Otis can share that with you. Um, make sure just you just wanted to jump oh, in. Sorry, sorry, Elena, for uh, doing a, a quick time check. So we will Ooh. slightly go over three. There will be uh, they, we've got a lot of questions. So yeah. Uh, just letting everybody know uh, that uh, if you're not in a rush, uh, we will go slightly uh, beyond uh, four o'clock. Uh, so yep. yeah, if you don't have anywhere to rush to, stay connected. And yeah, oh, excellent. Thanks. Um, so 
So we talked about deferring the payments and skipping a payment. I just want to show you what it looks like on a credit card when you do defer a payment. Um, again, your credit card has to be in good standing. Your account has to be open for more than six months, I believe. And each bank has its own rules. And uh, in addition to that, this is just a sample of how they're working out their repayment after you get a deferred payment. If you have a balance of $3,000, the interest rates are, have actually dropped to half, so you get about 11%. The minimum payments of um, the payment is 3%. Oops. And of course, um, they only give you a three-month deferral, and after the three months, you can always reapply. So we're right now in June. So if you, if you feel that, hey, I still need a little bit more time, please contact your bank again and ask for an extension. So the first payment of the first method is that the interest for the first three months, um, it will be payable as soon as deferral payment over. And that means that you will be asked to make your payments in July. And the calculations look like this. So you'll have $3,000 at an interest rate of 11%. And you'll see the calculations that for each month is um, a certain amount. So at the bottom, you'll see $82, which is the total of the interest. So come July, you'll have the regular minimum payment that was expected from you, plus the $82 of the previous three months of interest. Therefore, your July minimum payment will be 172. So again, if money's tight, this could be you know, a, a bit hard to manage. However, there is a second method that people are looking at, and that is the second one, which is like, you have a previous balance of $3,000, uh, your accrued interest is $82, so they'll add it to the balance, the, the interest rate, and then they'll figure out the minimum payment, which is a 3%, it's only $93. So again, you know, we, we would all love method two. However, the reality is that it's up to your bank to see which method it is. So before you ask for that payment deferral, make sure you find out exactly which method they're asking if you're okay with that. So if you're considering defer, deferring your credit cards, again, ask your bank to see how they're going to handle the interest accrued. Otherwise, it's just gonna assume that your balance stays frozen at 3,000. You know, we would all think that that would be the ideal thing, which is we have a balance of 3,000, we don't have to pay. But the reality is life it does happen, which means that you might be tempted to use a credit card to subsidize your, your other expenses with that credit card, therefore that balance could grow and therefore the interest could also grow. So please be careful. Fraud and scams, I'm not sure if I have enough time for that, but I do wanna make sure, I think it's just two more slides, so I, I'll be very, very quick. Um, right now, there's a lot of fraud going on. Um, there used to be a lot of fraud before, but it's more now, which they're calling you for different things. So to protect yourself, please make sure that um, you, you, you can call them back. Um, anything that has to do with healthcare or research information, you know, you, you, you ask as many questions and if they say to you, please confirm, you say, you know what, I'm not comfortable confirming anything right now with you. However, you give me your information and I'll get back to you. Normally when you say that, they just hang up. I've had calls where they're saying, you know, don't hang up. This is, uh, you know, if you hang up, you're going to go to jail. And that's, I'm like, and of course, I'm a little afraid, just like everyone else. But then I stay on the line and I'm like, okay, you called me. And I'm like, what do you need from me? And they're like, well, uh, I'm like, you called me. So you tell me my name. You tell me what you're calling about. And I start asking them questions about me. They don't have anything on me. So therefore, this is fraud. They hang up because they know I'm onto them. And that's done. But please be very careful. I'm at the question side, so I'm happy to answer questions at this time. All right, thank you, Elena. Thank you um, uh, for that presentation. And now we'll we'll move on into the uh, Q and A section of this uh, presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions, uh, so we are close to the four p.m. mark, but uh, we will go over. Uh, sure. Elena is available to answer any questions, so yes. don't uh, feel like you need to rush out. Uh, so let's get to the questions right away. Uh, do some people use a credit card to pay another credit card bill or is this prohibited? No, people do that. And the thing that people do, um, 
in some companies, so for example, you you could have two credit cards and you're not using one and, and the, the, the credit card that you're not using, they're probably sending you letters or emails saying, by the way, um, you know, you could do a, a, a balance transfer. The only thing that we suggest is that when you do a balance transfer, be, be very, um, be very careful and pay attention to the, the due date because they're saying to you, they're offering you uh, free interest or no or zero interest for uh, introduction period of six months or when you transfer, they'll only give you three to six months. Uh, uh, again, a low interest uh, charges. Find out exactly how much that's going to cost you. And the one thing that I always say, it's like, it's all great if you can transfer over as long as you can cancel the first credit card that you had a balance on. Otherwise, my coworker calls it rinse and repeat because you're going to be able to just get yourself in the same thing over and over. It's, it becomes a vicious cycle. So if you can do it, excellent, do it because it's a lower interest rate and you could save yourself quite a bit of money. Okay, great. Um, and uh, someone has a question in, in terms of uh, making payments uh, for, I'm assuming this is for bills. Uh, what if I make a payment and it's less than the minimum payment? Right. So the credit card, um, they, they don't mind when you make the minimum payment. So they, they want, so they ask for a dollar and 50 cents. They want a dollar and 50 cents as a minimum payment. So if you pay a dollar and 55 cents, that's great but they just want the dollar and 50 cents. If you pay the whole thing out, that's great too. Again, the reason I keep going back to the minimum payment because that's exactly what they want. Um, so if you go less than that, you're gonna be considered delinquent. Okay, and I, I guess a follow up to that is when you make the minimum payment, if you carry a balance, you are likely going to have interest start getting charged on it. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct, yes. And now another question is, what is considered uh, the, an acceptable or good credit score in Canada? Anything around 750 and up, you're good. Okay. And, and, now, and sorry, just, and when I'm saying you're good, it means that you're considered low risk and you can pretty much get anything you want, but normally anything around a 680 and up, they're gonna look at you positively, but if you're from the 680 to the 720, 750, again, they're saying to you, okay, you're, you're good. But if you're, there's a lot of inquiries. When there's an inquiry, you lose about 10 points from 10 to 30 points. And when that happens, if the, just right away, you've had one inquiry, let's say that particular inquiry lost you 10 points and you're at 700, you've just lost 10 points. You could qualify, but you'll lose the 10 points. So it, it's it's a math, right? It, it's a math formula. So the re, the way that that the formula works is like there's got to be some pluses and negatives, and the the best negative is when you when you someone does an inquiry in your account, that's when they're um they can deduct numbers. Okay, great. And this applies to mortgage rates, right? Uh, the uh, credit card the credit rating. It, it, there's no different rating. Uh, to that, this is another question. Well, yeah, the credit score is for any type of credit that you're looking for. So if you're looking for a mortgage, if you're looking for a car loan, if you're looking for a credit card, the same score, people will read it and they'll pretty much say, okay, yes, I'm willing to give you um, credit for X um, as long as you qualify for all the criteria, including the credit score. Okay. And someone has an interesting question about uh, companies advertising to fix debt uh, on credit cards. Yeah. Is this legit? Uh, how does it work? And does uh, it have any impact on your credit history? Okay, so what we know, I mean, we, we've been um, so aware that there's a lot of companies out there that will claim that they can fix your credit history or your credit report. And the reality is that no one can do that except time. But... If there is a problem that's happened on, or there's a, something, some information was miscommunicated from the creditor to the credit bureau, you can prove that. So for example, you made your payment on time, you have a record that you made your payment on time, but for some reason, the computer didn't recognize it for, and recognize it as a late payment. Because you have all the documentation, you can contact the, the credit bureaus directly, plus the creditors, 
and have it investigated with all your documentations and you can have that changed no problem and so if a company says to you we can do that for two thousand dollars well you could do that yourself for free so there's only so much they can do and the thing is because you could do it for free you'll know exactly what's happening every step of the way a company that takes over your file and you're paying them a lot of money and then they can come back and say sorry we can do it but they get to keep all your money which is not right either mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay great um, does it work against you to check your credit uh, or when others check your credit multiple times uh, for refinancing a home or taking out a loan so when you're when you're checking your credit history sorry let's go back if you're applying for a mortgage or refinancing a mortgage um, that's the example that I'm going with um, you can go to like three or four banks within the same month and they'll recognize it as one inquiry. However, if you say, well, you know, I'm going to check June and then I'm going to go on vacation, come back in July. Now that's two inquiries because it's done in two separate months. So yep. be very careful how, like you could do, a, let's say you get yourself a mortgage broker and they go like to maybe 20 companies. That's okay because they've only checked it once and they're sharing it with, their, with those other 20 companies. Mm -hmm. I guess the first part of the question, I can uh, uh, speak to that. Uh, checking your own credit won't impact your, yes. yourself. So you can do that uh, uh, through Equifax or TransUnion and you'll be able to see uh, what's on your credit report. Uh, going to another question here, does, does an overdraft, uh, overdraft account uh, affect your credit? Nope. Um, so when you set it up, um, they will check your credit report, but once you're using it, no, it will not affect your credit because it's just like a, a regular, like a bank account um, um, add-on. Uh, however, if you don't pay, if you um, just default on that, but it's like a loan, then yes, that will affect your, that could affect your credit report okay. score. Mm -hmm. So this is a question around collections. Uh, if someone had a debt in collections and they didn't pay it for over seven years, does that get removed from your credit report? or will it come back? You know, that's a good question. So the way it works is that um, normally your credit information stays there for six years. And the reason it stays there for six years, it's based on the fact that, let's say for example, I have a credit card with MBNA, I've been making my payments on time, and today I pay everything off. Six years from today, that information would be deleted because I'm no longer going to use it. But let's say I decided not to make any payments and although I'm not making any payments, MBNA is still calling me, sending me letters. So there's some type of activity happening, although it's not from my side or it's not together, it's only from MBNA. That is what's going to prolong that information on your file. So your the information could stay certainly a lot longer than six years because of the activity that's happening on your file. So that's the, the misunderstanding. But if there has been absolutely no contact whatsoever, no emails, no letters, no, no phone calls for six years, yes, then that information will be deleted from your file. What happens though is that a lot of times collection agencies will come around because they've bought the file and say, listen, you have this outstanding debt and you have to pay it. That's That gets a little more tricky because they can threaten to put that information into your file, which they can't because it's illegal. However, they can take you to court and it's up to you to prove that the statute of limitation has actually expired. So you'll have to do, um, you'll have, sorry, it's called a statement of claim, a statement of defense. And so you'll have to file a statement of defense once you get your, your, um, your, your legal papers. Okay, great. So this uh, question about inquiries, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, inquiries uh, have an impact on someone's credit score. Uh, how many points do, does each inquiry uh, have uh, in terms of points being taken off if it's a hard inquiry? It, it can depend. It, it can go from 10 points to 30 points. So normally, um, and again, that's a formula, that's just part of the formula. And it's funny because the creditors, sorry, 
Equifax and TransUnion won't tell you exactly. It's like, if it if you apply for a credit card, you'll lose 10 points. If you apply for a loan, you'll lose 20 points. If you apply for a mortgage, you'll lose 30 points. This doesn't work like that. It's, it's a specific formula that they use. And it's very... Um, it's independent so it's mm -hmm. it's very customized specific to the person that they're um they're working for so each individual will ha will have their own formula like 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 i said because i lived here longer my credit history um is based more on the number of years that i've lived here than compared to someone who's just been here two years mm -hmm. okay two final questions one oh, is yeah. about yeah one is about credit uh, line uh, how does it work and how does the prime interest rate work oh cool so the the the, the line of credit basically um you when you get it you you apply for it it's it's almost like a credit card a lot of the banks what they do is they pro actually provide you a card for it so you can just go and and use it the one thing um you, you would just be able to withdraw money from um the account um you could use it as a as a visa card or whatever the one thing that I don't like about the line of credit is the fact that it's you, you can't really track where you've um, you spent the money because you're just taking the money out and then you can use it any way you want to. With the credit card, every time you make a purchase, it will show you where where you, um, you know, the purchases that you made. Um, with regards to the interest rate, um, it, it's, uh, it, it, it all depends again on the bank because it's normally the, uh, the prime rate plus either 2%, 5%, even as high as 6%. So, and right now I believe it's 2.5% uh, the prime rate, and therefore they'll add it to, to whatever the bank wants to charge you. So sometimes prime rates, uh, sorry, the interest rates for a line of credit could be anywhere from 8 6% to about 12%. Okay, great. And uh, can you deny a creditor from asking for your credit report? Uh, for example, a landlord. No, 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 you can't. Um, I wish you could, but you can't. Because, I mean, they could, you could deny the person. You could say, no, I'm, I'm not comfortable you checking my credit report, um, like an employer or, or a landlord, and they'll say, okay, that's fine. Um, with regards to a job, you really can't be denied a job, but that they, they could say, you know, it is mandatory, so then you'll have to. Same thing with the landlord. They'll say, yeah, that's fine. Um, but then because you're, you're not renting from them anyways, they'll say, well, sorry, we went with someone else. And they don't have to tell you why that, you know, that they didn't give you the apartment or the house because you, you didn't give them the credit report. So they have the right to ask. Mm -hmm. And then one final question. Yeah. Is there way, any way to reduce the interest we pay uh, to the bank? Yeah. Uh, I think this person said they are paying um, a high interest rate. On a credit card? Um, not sure if it's specifically regarding a credit card. Um, uh, they just said they are paying an APR of uh, 24%. Could be a credit card. So if it's a credit card and you, as long as you've been making your payments um, on time for the last six months, you can always call back the bank and ask that they re do or the, sorry use the right wording lower your interest rate um to the lowest interest rate possible and sometimes they, they'll say no we can't and and they're not saying that they can't lower the interest rate they're saying that they can't lower the interest rate for that particular product so you'll have to say well is it because of the product and if that's the case then transfer me to another product that is a lower interest rate and then they'll do that yeah okay Sorry, there was one question that uh, uh, was uh, in the other section. Uh, what about those companies in the U.S. that say they have a legislation that allows people to erase uh, or correct past collections on their credit report? The person pays it off after the fact. Isn't there legislation or companies like this in Canada? No, um, it is. There is. It's called a consumer proposal where they're saying, and a lot of these companies, what they're doing is they're saying, they're saying that and in, in, in find those postings on, on Facebook and stuff like that or YouTube. Um, but really, what you have to understand is that they're, um, they're, they're asking you basically to come in, meet with a counselor, and that counselor will tell you that your options are either a consumer proposal or bankruptcy. And 
that may not be right for you because they're only talking about just one or two options. Best thing always to do is go to someone that you don't have to pay, that it's absolutely free. Go to your bank or go to an accountant, but better yet, you know, go to a not-for-profit credit counseling agency and get as much information as possible, then make your decisions. Okay. So we've come to the end of our presentation. Thank you, Elena, for the, that informative uh, session. And thank you everyone for joining us and for all your questions. Uh, that's uh, Elena's uh, contact thank information. You. Uh, yes. you, if you want to reach out to her directly, uh, a copy of this presentation will be made available uh, on our website. And Great. do connect with us uh, at Access Community Capital Fund, uh, either on all of those social media channels and directly uh, by email. Uh, we will be sharing an evaluation with you. Uh, you should uh, probably have received it in your inboxes. We are kindly ask you to sh um, give us your feedback so that we can plan future sessions. Uh, you can go to our website at accessccf.com and uh, or you can contact us by email at admin at accessccf.com. So we look forward to uh, you joining us in other future webinars uh, and stay connected with us. And thank you again, Elena, for your time and your uh, invaluable information. Uh, and uh, have a great day, everyone. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Excellent, thank you. Thanks so much, Otis. Take care, Bye. everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Bye-bye.